As October rolls around and we enter that late fall time period, it's easy to stop thinking about gardening for pollinators. But even though the days and nights are getting colder and the leaves are starting to turn, there are still butterflies and bees and flowerflies and other insects out visiting whatever flowers they can find. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about some of the native plants that bloom in the late fall and are visited by a variety of pollinators and other insects. Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, please visit my Patreon page. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, YouTube channel, and email list. One of the most common pieces of advice given related to pollinator gardening is to try and have a constant supply of blooms available throughout the growing season. That's easy in the spring. Everything is blooming then. The summer is a little more challenging than the spring, but it's still relatively easy. Even early fall isn't too bad, thanks to the goldenrods, ironreeds, and other fall flowers. It's the shoulder seasons that are the most challenging for providing flowers for pollinators. By shoulder seasons, I mean the late winter, early spring, and the late fall, early winter. To give you an idea of how those time periods look on the calendar, where I live in Kentucky, the shoulder seasons usually happen in February, March, and October, November. Your shoulder seasons may occur at slightly different times, depending on how far north or south you live and at what elevation you live because that can change things quite a bit too. The reason that the shoulder seasons are difficult is because the weather is so crazy at that time. In Kentucky, especially at certain times of the year, we often joke that you can experience all four seasons within 24 hours here. We act as if that's something unique to us, but many of my friends who live in other states make similar boasts about their states. And honestly, it isn't even unique to the U.S. Right after college, I spent the summer working on a duck project in Saskatchewan. When I arrived, there wasn't a spot of snow to be seen, and I was running around in a sweatshirt. A few days later, there was three feet of snow on the ground, and I was wearing my heavy coat and hat. The truth is that the shoulder seasons always have crazy weather, no matter where you live. And It's that crazy weather that makes it so difficult to provide flowers for pollinators during the shoulder seasons. Most flowers just can't handle the cold temps, frosts, and freezes that are often associated with this time period. But there are a few native plants that can handle the crazy weather of the shoulder seasons. I'm recording this in October. So I'm going to focus on native plants that bloom in the late fall, early winter shoulder season, or that October-November time period. One side note, though. Many of our goldenrods, white fall asters, thoroughworts, and other fall flowers will still bloom well into October if the weather is good. I can look out any window in my house right now and see tons of flowers still blooming. Some of those species have been blooming since August, and the pollinators are still working all of those species. However, most of those flowers will be killed off with the first good frosts. The plants that I'm focusing on today are the ones that typically don't start to bloom until around October, and that can survive those first frosts after most of the earlier blooming fall flowers are gone. The first native plant that I want to talk about, which blooms in the late fall, is a tall shrub or short tree. It's American witch hazel, Hamamillus virginiana. American witch hazel is found in moist, semi-open woods throughout most of the eastern U.S. and even up into parts of eastern Canada. 
American witch hazel has bright yellow flowers with long, thin petals. It's really kind of an odd looking flower. And the flowers produce both pollen and nectar. And they are most often visited by small flies and bees. They bloom in this late fall time period. And it can be so weird to see yellow flowers on a tree in the woods at a time when yellow leaves are much more common. I've even seen pictures of the flowers with snow on them. To help combat the crazy cold spells that happen in the late fall, the petals will even curl up sometimes to form a protective covering over the rest of the flower when the temperatures plummet. I just think American witch hazel is a really interesting plant. It can be grown as a native ornamental shrub along a string bank or in a more formal planting. I haven't started growing it yet, but I want to. We need to do some work on a string bank first, but I think witch hazel would look so nice mixed into the woods there. If you are growing American witch hazel in a more formal ornamental setting, then you'll want to plant it in a semi-shady area where it it can have a little extra moisture. That extra moisture can come from natural drainage or from irrigation. In addition to American witch hazel, there are four other species of witch hazel. One of those species is native to Alabama and Mississippi. Another is native to Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Texas, and California. The last two are native to China and Japan, respectively. It's important to recognize that there are other species if you are looking to purchase an American witch hazel, because you will likely need to find a native plant nursery that is growing it. Witch hazels are in the horticulture trade, and they can be found sometimes at traditional plant nurseries, but those are usually cultivars of the Asian species or hybrids of the Asian species. I don't know much about the Asian species, but I do know that they bloom at a different time of the year than the American witch hazel. I'm also not sure when those other two species that are native to the U.S. bloom, or whether native plant nurseries and their range might carry them. Sorry I can't be more help on that front. Since they aren't native to where I live, I'm not very familiar with them beyond knowing that they exist. However, if you live in a state where one of those other two witch hazels are native, then I am sure that your state's Native Plant Society could tell you all about that species and whether any of the native plant nurseries in your state carries it. The next two plants that I want to talk about are both some of our perennial fall asters. They are Shorts aster, Symphiotrichum shortii, and Wavy Leaf aster, Symphiotrichum undulatum. Both have little pale blue flowers. Shorts aster is native to most, but not all, of the eastern half of the U.S. While wavy leaf aster is native to most, but not all, of the eastern two-thirds of the U.S. I talked about some of the fall asters in an earlier episode that I'll link to in the show notes. But these two species bloom even later than many of the more familiar fall asters, which is why I love them. Shorts aster usually doesn't even start blooming until early October where I live and will bloom throughout the month and into November. Wavy leaf aster is usually two to three weeks behind shorts aster. I frequently see honeybees and bumblebees and other little insects visiting the flowers of at least one of these two species into at least mid-November and occasionally as late as Thanksgiving. Both of these species like some shade and can be grown in semi-shady areas around your home. However, they don't like full shade. Wavy leaf aster especially will die out if it is planted in too deep of shade. Shorts aster can tolerate a decent amount of shade, but it won't necessarily thrive there. However, neither of these are full sun species either. Just as an example, I collected my first shorts aster seeds 
from a redbud grove that my mother has let grow up at her house. Mom's short asters get some sun, but not a whole lot. They have naturally spread throughout her redbud grove, and they continue to spread naturally there. But they are growing as single stems here and there. I took the seeds that I collected and grew some of them for myself and some for our native plant nursery. The ones I grew for myself, I planted under a maple tree. They aren't in complete shade, but it's definitely more shade than sun and quite a bit more shade than my mother's short asters get. It took mine forever to take off and start growing. Finally, they are starting to flower every year, but they aren't spreading and they just seem to be existing. However, a year or two after I planted mine, a friend bought one of my short asters from my nursery and he gave it to his mother. She planted hers in an area that gets more sun than either mine or my mother's short asters. Hers has produced an absolutely gorgeous mound of flowers that gets slightly bigger each year. And it has done that in less time than mine or my mother's have been growing. That just goes to show how important finding exactly the right spot for your plants can be. After seeing what hers has done in less time than mine, I'm definitely looking for another place where I can move my short asters. It also goes to show that we all plant things in the wrong spot sometimes. I think part of gardening is learning by trial and error what works well in any given spot. We can make really good educated guesses, but sometimes you just have to plan it and see what happens. If the plant doesn't seem happy, then you can always move it someplace else. The fourth plant I want to share with you is tick seed sunflower, Bodens aristosa. Despite the common name, this is not a sunflower, although it is in the same family. And I'm going to tell you right from the beginning that this plant is not for everyone or every location. Tick seed sunflower is native to most of the eastern half of the U.S., and it likes sunny, moist spots. It produces bright yellow flowers that are attractive to a wide range of bees and butterflies. Birds will also devour the seeds. However, there are two reasons why tick seed sunflower might not be the right plant for you or your garden. The first is that it can spread pretty aggressively and because of that, can sometimes look a little weedy. Planting it in a slightly drier area can tame some of its aggressiveness, but I still wouldn't plant it with very delicate plants. The second reason that tick seed sunflower isn't for every situation is that it is one of the plants that produces the flat seeds with the pokey things at the back that stick to your jeans, jackets, or in your socks when you walk through the fields in the fall and winter. That's definitely not something that you want to plant next to the sidewalk or other high traffic area, or probably even in an area where you may be weeding on a regular basis. In landscaped situations, tick seed sunflower is best grown in a sunny ditch or a wetter area that you can see, but where no one really walks. It's a beautiful flower and can produce a gorgeous display, but it needs room to go wild. And most people don't like picking the seeds out of their clothes all the time during the fall and early winter. However, as long as you are aware of those characteristics and choose wisely where you want to plant it, tick seed sunflower can work in certain landscape situations. 
and it definitely has a place in larger pollinator plantings. Now, I debated about whether to include this last species because you can't really plant it. You either have it or you don't. I finally decided to include it because it is such a fascinating plant, can bloom into early winter, and can be found in many different locations. It is American mistletoe, Phorodendron leucarpum. American mistletoe is found throughout most of the eastern U.S. and into parts of the West. It is a partially parasitic shrub, which technically is called hemiparasitic, that grows within tops of trees. It prefers to grow on hardwoods like oaks, maples, ashes, walnuts, and others. Late fall and winter are really easy times to spot mistletoe because it is evergreen. So, once the trees lose their leaves, the mistletoe looks like big dark green balls in the bare limbs. Depending on where you are at, American mistletoe may start blooming as late as October or November and may continue to bloom until December or January. That's not exactly the time of year when most of us are thinking about pollinators. Another reason we may not typically think of mistletoe as being an important plant for pollinators is because it's often way up in the tops of the trees, so we never see its flowers. However, many different types of insects, including wasps, bees, and ants, frequently visit American mistletoe flowers. For my fellow beekeepers, this is always one of my suspects when I see pollen coming into my hives on a warm December day. Mistletoe is also a host plant for the great purple hair streak butterfly. Female mistletoe plants produce white berries that have a sticky seed and pulp. Birds love the berries and will gobble them up. Some of the seeds get stuck on the bird's feet or feathers, while others pass through the digestive tract fairly quickly. Either way, the result is that the birds tend to spread the mistletoe seeds from one branch or tree to the next as they hop around. Two questions that I've gotten when talking about mistletoe are, one, do mistletoes hurt the tree? And two, how can I plant it? The answer to the first question about potential impacts to the health of the host tree isn't clear. There are multiple species of mistletoes and they don't all grow on the same host plants, and not all of the research has been done on every species of mistletoe. So some resources say that trees serving as hosts for mistletoes in general have a significantly shortened lifespan. Others say that any damage mistletoes do is dependent on things like the health of the tree, how much mistletoe it is supporting, and numerous other factors. It's also important to recognize that much of the research suggesting a shortened lifespan for host trees was done on mistletoe species that prefer conifers. I couldn't find much directly related to American mistletoes, which prefer hardwoods. The answer to the second question about how to plant mistletoe, that's easy. You can't. There is no commercial source for mistletoe plants or seeds. Even though it is only hemiparasitic, it can't survive without its host plant. So there's no way to grow mistletoes to sell. Also, since it grows in the tops of trees, we can't really go around planting it. We have to rely on the birds to transport the seeds, which is why I say you either have it or you don't. If you don't have it and you want it, then doing things to attract more berry-eating birds to the trees in your yard is probably your best bet for getting the birds to plant a mistletoe seed 
on one of your trees. Sometimes we just have to admire plants from afar and can't easily bring them into our yards. Now, I know I started out by talking about how important late fall nectar sources can be for late season pollinators. However, please don't get too stressed out about making sure you have something blooming at this time of year. This is especially true when you are just starting your pollinator gardens. I know that it can sometimes be overwhelming to try and keep everything straight and to make sure that you are doing the very best you possibly can and providing all the different types of nectar sources at all the right times. If you're starting to feel overwhelmed, then take a deep breath and recognize that it is okay to concentrate your efforts on the primary growing season. Remember, when we are talking about pollinator gardens around our houses, that often means we have yards surrounding those gardens. In this case, that's a good thing. Because if you are interested in planting for pollinators, then there's a good chance that you don't have the perfect yard of nothing but grass. Instead, you probably have some yard weeds. And all those non-native yard weeds, like dandelions, clover, henbit, and dead nettle, often bloom during the shoulder seasons. So use that to your advantage. Let them bloom. Then you still have something for your late season pollinators. Native plants might be better, but your yard weed flowers will still help. It doesn't have to be perfect or the best all of the time. But if you've been gardening for pollinators for a while and you already have a pretty good selection of native plants that bloom during the primary growing season, and you're looking for a way to take things to the next level, then mixing in some of these late season bloomers might be something to consider. If you want some easy, quick ways to attract pollinators to your yard, check out my newest book, Attract Pollinators and Wildlife to Your Yard, 15 free and easy ways. Visit the webpage for this episode to learn more about the book and to place your order. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.